When we choose silence, we choose to give up the reasons not to love, which are the reasons for going to war, or continuing war, or separating, or being a victim, or being right. In a moment of silence, in a moment of no thought, no mind, we choose to give those up. This is what my teacher invited me to. Just choose silence. Don't even choose love. Choose silence, and love is apparent. If we choose love, we already have an idea of what love is. But if you choose silence, that is the end of ideas. You are willing to have no idea, to see what is present when there is no idea, past, present, future. No idea of love, no idea of truth, no idea of you, no idea of me. Love is apparent. Gangaji, 2009. God bade me behold the sea, and I saw the ships sinking and the planks floating. Then the planks, too, were submerged. And God said to me, those who voyage are not saved. And he said to me, those who, instead of voyaging, cast themselves into the sea, take a risk. And he said to me, those who voyage and take no risk shall perish. And he said to me, in taking the risk, there is a part of salvation. And the wave came and lifted those beneath it and overran the shore. And he said to me, the surface of the sea is a gleam that cannot be reached, and the bottom is a darkness and between the two are great fishes, which are to be feared. Nefari, circa 970. What? Lustily, I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When, from behind that craggy steep, till then the horizons found, a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, grim shape towered up between me and the stars. But after I had seen that spectacle, for many days, my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. And my thoughts... My darkness... Call it solitude. A blank desertion. William Wordsworth.
A poet once said, the whole universe is in a glass of wine. We will probably never know in what sense he meant that, for poets do not write to be understood. But it is true that if we look at a glass of wine closely enough, we see the entire universe. There are the things of physics, the twisting liquid which evaporates depending on the wind and weather, the reflections in the glass, and our imagination adds the atoms. The glass is a distillation of the Earth's rocks, and in its composition we see the secrets of the universe's age and the evolution of stars. What strange array of chemicals are in the wine? How did they come to be? There are the ferments, the enzymes, the substrates, and the products. There in wine is found the great generalization. All life is fermentation. Nobody can discover the chemistry of wine without discovering, as did Louis Pasteur, the cause of much disease. How vivid is the claret, pressing its existence into the consciousness that watches it. If our small minds, for some convenience, divide this glass of wine, this universe, into parts, physics, biology, geology, astronomy, psychology, and so on, remember that nature does not know it. So let us put it all back together, not forgetting ultimately what it is for. Let it give us one more final pleasure. Drink it and forget it all. Richard Feynman. 1963. We have two kinds of knowledge which I call symbolic and intimate. I do not know whether it would be correct to say that reasoning is only applicable to symbolic knowledge, but the more customary forms of reasoning have been developed for symbolic knowledge only. The intimate knowledge will not submit to codification and analysis, or rather, when we attempt to analyze it, the intimacy is lost and replaced by symbolism. For an illustration, let us consider humor. I suppose that humor can be analyzed to some extent in the essential ingredients of the different kinds of wit classified. Suppose that we are offered an alleged joke. We subject it to scientific analysis as we would a chemical salt of doubtful nature and perhaps after careful consideration, we are able to confirm that it really and truly is a joke. Logically, I suppose, our next procedure would be to laugh. But it may certainly be predicted that as the result of this scrutiny, we shall have lost all inclination we ever had to laugh at it. It simply does not do to expose the workings of a joke. Classification concerns a symbolic knowledge of humor, which preserves all the characteristics of a joke except its laughableness. The real appreciation must come spontaneously, not introspectively. I think this is a not unfair analogy for our mystical feeling for nature, and I would venture even to apply it to our mystical experience of God. There are some to whom the sense of a divine presence irradiating the soul is one of the most obvious things of experience. In their view, a man without this sense is to be regarded as we regard a man without a sense of humor. The absence is a kind of mental deficiency. We may try to analyze the experience as we analyze humor and construct a theology, or it may be an atheistic philosophy. But let us not forget that the theology is symbolic knowledge, whereas the experience is intimate knowledge. And as laughter cannot be compelled by the scientific exposition of the structure of a joke, so a philosophic discussion of the attributes of God, or an impersonal substitute, is likely to miss the intimate response of the spirit which is the central point of the religious experience. Arthur Eddington, 1927. Suppose a boat is crossing a river and another empty boat is about to collide with it. Even an irritable man would not lose his temper. But supposing there was someone in the second boat, then the occupant of the first would shout to him to keep clear 
and if the other did not hear the first time, or even when called three times, bad language would inevitably follow. In the first case, there was no anger. In the second, there was. Because in the first case, the boat was empty. And in the second, it was occupied. And so it is with man. If he could only roam empty through life, who would be able to injure him? Shuangzi, 4th century BC. One day, I happened to be occupied with the subject of generation of waves by wind. I took down the standard treatise on hydrodynamics, and under that heading I read, if the external forces P prime sub YY, P prime sub XY, be given multiples of E to the IKX plus AT, where K and A are prescribed, the equations in question determine A and C, and thence, by nine, the value of eta, and so on for two pages. At the end, it is made clear that a wind of less than half a mile an hour will leave the surface unruffled. At a mile an hour, the surface is covered with minute corrugations due to capillary waves which decay immediately if the disturbing cause ceases. At two miles an hour, the gravity waves appear. As the author modestly concludes, our theoretical investigations give considerable insight into the incipient stages of wave formation. On another occasion, the same subject of generation of waves by wind was in my mind, but this time another book was more appropriate, and I read, There are waters blown by changing winds to laughter, and lit by the rich skies all day, and after, frost, with a gesture, stays the waves that dance and wandering loveliness. He leaves a white, unbroken glory, a gathered radiance, a width, a shining peace under the night. The magic words bring back the scene. Again, we feel nature drawing close to us, uniting with us, till we are filled with the gladness of the waves dancing in the sunshine, with the awe of the moonlight on the frozen lake. These were not moments when we fell below ourselves. We did not look back on them and say, it was disgraceful for a man with six sober senses and a scientific understanding to let himself be deluded in that way. I will take Lamb's hydrodynamics with me next time. It is good that there should be such moments for us. Life would be stunted and narrow if we could feel no significance in the world around us beyond that which can be weighed and measured with the tools of the physicist or described by the metrical symbols of the mathematician. Of course, it was an illusion. We can easily expose the rather clumsy trick that was played on us. Ethereal vibrations of various wavelengths, reflected at different angles from the disturbed interface between air and water, reached our eyes, and by photoelectric action caused appropriate stimuli to travel along the optic nerves to a brain center. Here, the mind set to work to weave an impression out of the stimuli. The incoming material was somewhat meager, but the mind is a great storehouse of associations that could be used to clothe the skeleton. Having woven an impression, the mind surveyed all that it had made and decided that it was very good. The critical faculty was lulled. We ceased to analyze and were conscious only of the impression as a whole. The warmth of the air, the scent of the grass, the gentle stir of the breeze combined with the visual scene in one transcendent impression around us and within us. Associations emerging from their storehouse grew bolder Perhaps we recalled the phrase, rippling laughter. Waves, ripples, laughter, gladness. The ideas jostled one another. Quite illogically, we were glad. Though what there can possibly be to be glad about, in a set of ethereal vibrations, no sensible person can explain. A mood of quiet joy suffused the whole impression. The gladness in ourselves was in nature, in the waves, everywhere. That's how it was. It was an illusion. Then why toy with it longer? 
These airy fancies which the mind, when we do not keep it severely in order, projects into the external world should be of no concern to the earnest seeker after truth. Get back to the solid substance of things, to the material of the water moving under the pressure of the wind and the force of gravitation in obedience to the laws of hydrodynamics. But the solid substance of things is another illusion. It too is a fancy projected by the mind into the external world. We have chased the solid substance from the continuous liquid to the atom, from the atom to the electron, and there we have lost it. But at least it will be said, we have reached something real at the end of the chase, the protons and electrons. Or, if the new quantum theory condemns these images as too concrete and leaves us with no coherent images at all, at least we have symbolic coordinates and momenta and Hamiltonian functions, devoting themselves with single-minded purpose to ensuring that QP minus PQ shall be equal to IH over 2 pi. I have tried to show that by following this course we reach a cyclic scheme which, from its very nature, can only be a partial expression of our environment. It is not reality, but the skeleton of reality. Actuality has been lost in the exigencies of the chase. Having first rejected the mind as a worker of illusion, we have, in the end, to return to the mind and say, here are worlds well and truly built on a basis more secure than your fanciful illusions, but there is nothing to make any one of them an actual world. Please choose one and weave your fanciful images into it. That alone can make it actual. We have torn away the mental fancies to get at the reality beneath, only to find that the reality of that which is beneath is bound up with its potentiality of awakening these fancies. It is because the mind, the weaver of illusion, is also the only guarantor of reality, that reality is always to be sought at the base of illusion. Illusion is to reality as the smoke to the fire. I will not urge that hoary untruth, there is no smoke without fire, but it is reasonable to inquire whether, in the mystical illusions of man, there is not a reflection of an underlying reality. Arthur Eddington, 1927. O oh Lord God, helper of those who seek you, I see you in the garden of paradise, and I do not know what I see, because I see nothing visible. I know this alone, that I know that I do not know what I see, and that I can never know. I do not know how to name you, because I do not know what you are. Should anyone tell me that you are named by this or that name, by the fact that one gives a name, I know that it is not your name. For the wall beyond which I see you is the limit of every mode of signification by names. Should anyone express any concept by which you could be conceived, I know that this concept is not a concept of you. For every concept finds its boundary at the wall of paradise. Should anyone express any likeness and say that you ought to be conceived according to it, I know in the same way that this is not a likeness of you. So too, if anyone, wishing to furnish the means by which you might be understood, should set forth an understanding of you, one is still far removed from you. For the highest wall separates you from all these and secludes you from everything that can be said or thought, because you are absolute from all the things that can fall within any concept. Nicholas of Cusa, 1453. We join spokes together in a wheel, but it is the center hole that makes the wagon move. We shape clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside that holds whatever we want. We hammer wood for a house, but it is the inner space that makes it livable. We work with being, but non-being is what we use. Lao Tzu, 6th century BC. The glass is transparent, the wine transparent. The two are similar, the affair confused. There seems to be wine and no glass. 
or glass and no wine. Sahib bin Abad, circa 990. There is nothing in existence but veils hung down. Acts of perception attach themselves only to veils, which leave traces in the owner of the eye that perceives them. Binarabi 1231. Your question is the most difficult in the world. It is not a question I can answer simply with yes or no. I am not an atheist. I do not know if I can define myself as a pantheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. May I not reply with a parable? The human mind, no matter how highly trained, cannot grasp the universe. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books, does not know how, does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what that is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of the most intelligent human toward God. Albert Einstein, 1930. The concept of a clock enfolds all succession in time. In the concept, the sixth hour is not earlier than the seventh or eighth, although the clock never strikes the hour, save when the concept biddeth. Nicholas of Cusa, 1450. The concept of a clock enfolds all succession in time. In the concept, the sixth hour is not earlier than the seventh or eighth, although the clock never strikes the hour, save when the concept biddeth. Nicholas of Cusa, 1450. That's mine, you know. Yeah. Well, I have some ideas about it, and I just wanted to give it a try. See how it goes? Next thing I know, you'll be taking over all the Kusa pieces. What kind of idea? I don't know. Subconscious drives, right? Like, with anything creative. Did you feel this way before your trip to the island? Or after? Well, I think... After. Yeah, uh, mostly after. I had a seed of it before, even back when I first heard the piece, when you first picked it out. But I didn't really notice then. Now it's like the princess and the pea. I don't mean to be stepping on your toes, though. I really, the drive is personal. I wanted to record this one so I can hear it the way I want to hear it just to set something right for myself. Okay. I'm gonna file this into the category of good problems to have. Your attitude to the piece changed or clarified, I guess, maybe based on the trip. Yeah. That means it's working. I mean, something's working, right? Maybe. <laughs> Back when we started, I would have counted as lucky to ever get this far. <laughs> but here we are. Record away, and I will take my leave, thanking you for this opportunity to introspect on my aversive feelings. <laughs> You're welcome. It is a great adventure to contemplate the universe beyond man, to contemplate what it would be like without man as it was in a great part of its long history and as it is in a great majority of places. When this objective view is finally attained and the mystery and majesty of matter are fully appreciated, 
to then turn the objective eye back on man, viewed as matter, to view life as part of this universal mystery of the greatest depth, is to sense an experience which is very rare and very exciting. It usually ends in laughter and a delight in the futility of trying to understand what this atom in the universe is, this thing atoms with curiosity that looks at itself and wonders why it wonders. Well, the scientific views end in awe and mystery, lost at the edge in uncertainty, but they appear to be so deep and so impressive that the theory that it is all arranged as a stage for God to watch man struggle for good and evil seems inadequate. Some will tell me that I have just described a religious experience. Very well, you may call it what you will. Then, in that language, I would say that the young man's religious experience is of such a kind that he finds the religion of his church inadequate to describe, to encompass that kind of experience. The God of the church isn't big enough. Richard Feynman, 1963. Imagine if all the tumult of the body were to quiet down, along with all our busy thoughts about earth, sea, and air. If the very world should stop, and the mind cease thinking about itself, go beyond itself, and be quite still. If all the fantasies that appear in dreams and imagination should cease, and there be no speech, no sign. Imagine if all things that are perishable grew still. For if we listen, they are saying, we did not make ourselves. He made us who abides forever. Imagine then that they should say this and fall silent, listening to the very voice of him who made them and not to that of his creation, so that we should hear not his word through the tongues of men, nor the voice of angels, nor the clouds thunder, nor any symbol, but his very self, which in these things we love. And go beyond ourselves to attain a flash of that eternal wisdom which abides above all things. And imagine if that moment were to go on and on, leaving behind all other sights and sounds but this one vision, which ravishes and absorbs and fixes the beholder in joy so that the rest of eternal life were like that moment of illumination which leaves us breathless. Would this not be what is bidden in scripture? Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Augustine of Hippo, circa 400. Oh, my God, how does it happen in this poor old world that thou art so great and yet nobody finds thee, that thou callest so loudly and nobody hears thee? That thou art so near, and nobody feels thee. That thou givest thyself to everybody, and nobody knows thy name. Men flee from thee, and say they cannot find thee. They turn their backs, and say they cannot see thee. They stop their ears, and say they cannot hear thee. Hans Dank, circa 1520.